In this video, we will be discussing what a cooling tower is, how it works, and common types used in the HVAC industry. So what is a cooling tower? Well, as you can see from the image, a cooling tower is used in water-cooled chiller plants, and its purpose in life is to reject facility heat to the atmosphere, meaning the air handling unit, chiller tandem, absorbs the building's heat and ultimately passes it to the cooling tower via the condenser water loop, which then transfers it to the ambient environment. To help explain how this heat transfer happens, let's discuss the two most common types of cooling towers used in HVAC, induced draft and forced draft evaporative towers. These towers simply take hot supply condenser water, evaporate a portion of its heat to the atmosphere, and return the remaining cooler condenser water to the facility to be used again to absorb heat. But how does this happen? Let's take a closer look. First, hot water is sprayed down over cooling tower material called fill which is where the heat transfer takes place. And the fill's purpose is effectively to increase the time the water and air cross paths. And there are several common types of fill as you can see, spray, splash, and film. Second, and in parallel, air is being pulled as with an induced draft tower or pushed with a forced draft tower via a fan motor combination across the fill. After the air and water interact, the now warmer, more humid air is rejected out of the cooling tower to the atmosphere, and the resulting cooler water collects at the bottom of the cooling tower before it's sent back to the building. So then a logical question is, why are there two tower designs that do the same thing? Well, induced draft towers are typically preferred over force draft because they require less energy to do the same job. Induced draft towers typically require about 0.05 horsepower per ton where force draft towers typically require about 0.08 horsepower per ton. So in a 1,000 ton or 3.5 megawatt chilled water plant, that means a 50 horsepower or 37 kilowatt tower versus an 80 horsepower or 60 kilowatt tower, whichever the course of the tower's lifetime, can be a difference of tens of thousands of dollars in operational costs. So with the compelling monetary incentives to use an induced draft tower, when would someone select a force draft tower? Well, they can be easier to maintain. They typically last longer since the fan components are not within the path of the saturated discharge air, and sometimes they can save space. So depending on the site requirements and climate, one design usually makes more sense to use over another. Additionally, note that tower operating costs can be modeled in detail in YorkWorks' YorkCalc software. Now to go just one technical layer deeper with these two tower types, there are a few important variations to mention. First, they can operate in a cross-flow or counterflow arrangement, meaning the air moves perpendicular to the falling water, a cross-flow arrangement, or in opposite directions with a counterflow arrangement. And there are various reasons why each is employed. Second, these towers can be an open design, as we're seeing here, or closed. In a closed tower, a coil is used for heat exchange rather than openly spraying condenser water in the tower. And there are several reasons why this type is used, such as it will operate in dusty or dirty environments where there are concerns of chiller tube fouling. The big drawback with this variation is it's inherently less efficient because it uses a coil rather than direct fluid to air heat transfer. Therefore, it will usually cost more to operate, but some of those expenses are offset by less frequent chiller maintenance. Therefore, there really needs to be a driving force for a designer to go with this cooling tower style. Now, as a side note, when talking cooling tower basics, a term commonly used is the approach temperature. This is the difference between the ambient wet bulb temperature entering the tower and the cooler water leaving the tower and being sent back to the building. The term approach is used because the tower's purpose is to return water that's as close as possible to, or approaching, the incoming air wet bulb temperature. On average, this design value will hover around 7 degrees Fahrenheit or 3.9 Celsius, as you can see from the math shown, but it can move in either direction depending on the climate, meaning in warmer, more humid climates, you will see smaller approach temperatures due to higher wet bulbs, and in cooler, drier climates, you will see higher approach temperatures due to lower average wet bulbs. This is all important information in the design and operation of a chiller plant. Lastly, although not within the detailed scope of this video, it should be mentioned that there are alternative designs that can be used to reject heat to the atmosphere. 
such as hybrid cooling towers, dry coolers, also known as air-cooled radiators, and evaporative condensers. Each has its application specialty, such as air-cooled radiators, for example, being used in regions where water is a more valuable resource than energy, meaning they cost more to operate but use less water. But effectively, each of these variations does the same job as an evaporative cooling tower by doing the final rejection of building heat to the atmosphere. High performance environments for life.